Hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the MobileCast. We're coming to you live from the MobileCast studio here in Oakland, New Jersey, and I'm your host, Brian Katz. Today's show should be interesting. It grew out of a conversation that started on Twitter, moved to blog post, and I thought it would be a great idea to move it to the MobileCast. We're going to be talking about data categorization and security and how it relates to mobile, and I'm really excited to have my friend Bill Pelletier as our guest tonight. Bill is an InfoSec professional who works at Liberty Mutual. Welcome to the mobile cast, Bill. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, Brian. Yep, as you said, uh, it's Bill Pelletier. That is, uh, that's who I am, an InfoSec professional. And this is usually where I say uh, to folks, hi, my name is Bill, and I'm an InfoSec professional. And wait for everybody to say hi, Bill. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been doing this stuff for now going on 15 years now and have been in IT longer than I want to really admit before that. So suffice it to say that uh, InfoSec is my career right now. Well, that's a good thing. You seem to be happy with it. And actually, you know, you've been on Twitter quite a bit. Um, that's how we originally met. Um, we have mutual friends, Bob Brutus. And so let's get started. Um, so let's set the stage for this discussion. Alessandro Festa put out a blog post talking about how difficult it is for um, enterprises to secure data. And his basic premise is that the first thing enterprises have to do is they have to categorize and classify their data. And the way he laid it out is you have many buckets and you put, you know, depending on what type of data you have, you have to classify that data so it goes into the right bucket and that's where you start protecting it. And what we'll do is we'll put actually put that post um, in the show notes so everybody in the audience can take a look at it. And I actually laid out in a separate post that categorizing data is really too hard for most companies because they spend forever doing it. They put committees together. They try and figure out what kind of data they have. They come up with 20, 30, 40 buckets, and then they have to train everybody how to do it. And by the time they get that done, that's two, three years of work, they're all ready to start over. And that's sort of where we started. And um, from that point, Alessandro kind of came back and said, well... That's not really it. You also have these other pieces that, you know, there's a difference between categorization and classification. And I came back and said, you're really being, you know, you're making this too hard. And that's where you kind of came in, Bill. You read this and you had a couple ideas on this. And I kind of wanted to, you know, with that stage set, kind of let this discussion just roll and we'll see what happens here. Sure. And, and I think, you know, going back to what we were, we were just discussing online at, at length, um, the the two two categories works from the perspective that you have stuff that you need to care about and protect, and then stuff that you need to care about but not necessarily protect. Uh, you know, the so-called public data. People use that term a lot. Uh, you know, where I was going with um, the discussion was, yeah, I, I look at it as basically having two categories: stuff to protect and care about, and stuff to care about the 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 second category is really you know, from our, my perspective three right you've got information that and i'm going to use information and data interchangeably i know i shouldn't but <laughs> but we all do that right yeah so uh, yeah let, let's be fair to everybody we're not going to be precise here um, i, I want to be <laughs> you know i i sometimes give people a hard time about either be we prefer you to be precise and accurate and in this case we're going to try and be more accurate than we are going to be precise. And the two categories that Bill's, Bill's talking about is what I laid out in my post is that there are two categories of data. There's company stuff and there's everything else. And what the company needs to protect is their stuff and ignore everything else. So if it's inside the company, we encrypt it. We're protecting it. doesn't matter where it goes. And, you know, Bill, you're proposing that that – second bucket of company stuff really becomes three buckets. Right. Three buckets in the sense that you are able to say with some level of certainty, um, I'm, I've got a, a bucket of things. I'm going to carve it up into three sections. The first section is data and information that anybody in the company can have access to. Right? It doesn't matter if you're in a different business unit or a different department. It's it, you would you would think of it as is corporate internal information, sort of like what's the cafeteria menu this week? 
Um, the cafeteria menu or, or uh, yeah, a more apropos item might be uh, a corporate office directory, right? Same thing. You know, wouldn't necessarily want to have that be listed on, on a billboard outside the building, but you would want you would want to have people have access to it on their intranet, for ex- as an example. Well, we can put it on a billboard for you, but I don't think either of us want to receive the calls from all the vendors. Absolutely. We get, get enough as it is. So you have your first bucket, which is, okay, we protect it from external, but we're okay with everybody looking at it. Yep. The 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 second portion of that second bucket, this is I'm gonna get all tongue twisted and tongue tied before we get done with this tonight, I can tell, is data and information that is pertinent to either a specific business unit or department or some other sub-entity within the organization. Uh, This could be something along the lines of a customer list. It could be, in the case of the insurance industry, it could be a, a set of rating tables, um, these are things that you have to be a member or a defined entity of the of the company. In other words, you're authenticated to be part of the company, and you have some type of authorization to see it that's granted as part of your affiliation, right? Not about you specifically, but about who you work with inside. So the- if I if I were going to simplify that, it's based upon group membership. So you get to look at something if you belong to the right group. Exactly. But belonging to that group does not necessarily require explicit uh, authorization from a manager or director or something else. You get it because of of what you do. Okay. It's it's part of your function. Could be if you're a sales rep within the company, you get access to all the first bucket stuff and all the second bucket stuff because you're a sales rep. We don't. You don't have to ask for it. Okay, and then now we have the third bucket. What's actually in the yep. third bucket? The third bucket is is a variation of the second one in that it is information that is internal to the company. It's it's of a more highly sensitive nature. Uh, sometimes you'll you'll hear it called uh, top secret in the military or whatever, or or restricted is another another common term. And it, it's information that is treated the same way as that second item. Except that to get access to it, you individually do require explicit authorization to be granted to you, right? So, so within a department of, say, 10 people, you might have three people that require the ability to edit those rating tables, as an example. And, so and you, so we talked about group. This really – this last group, this last bucket really gets down to individual. And yes. saying – I am who I am. And, yes. You know, so I put out a second post based, you know, Alessandro and I actually went back and forth. So there, there are actually a total of four posts here <laughs> for people to read. So, you know, it's a lot of words. Um, but when I looked at it, I don't necessarily disagree with you as far as, you know, you can start, you can do as many buckets as you want. You know, my basic premise is that no matter how many buckets you do, if you start with 20 or 30, you'll never get there because it takes too long to figure out how you put the data there, who's going to classify it, how you're going to classify it. But I look at more of what you're talking about as far as whether or not you can see it as um, pretty much what we talked about on last week's mobile podcast, um, on the mobile cast, where we talked about identity and access management. Mm-hmm. And so – your identity, you prove who you are, and you're granted access to see data or you're not granted access to see data. You know, in a, you know, for someone like me, that's NTFS permissions. If it right. was put in the share, I, I can let this be seen by everybody. I can let it be seen by this Active Directory group, or I can say only this user can see it and edit it. And those are the types of permissions that I hand out. And I see that as going hand in hand with my two bucket section. So you encrypt everything, but you still have the permissions and the permissions are still part of that data even while they're encrypted. Right. And you're, you're at now, you actually work for an insurance company. Correct. So you have to have seen this firsthand. How do you guys handle this sort of stuff? 
Um, I would be remiss in saying that we're we're still working on a lot of it, right? Because a, a lot of the systems that we have in place today have been grown uh, organically over time, and they actually come out of traditional client server models in the old days. Uh, so, and it was much easier back then, right? So if, if you look back at the old client server type systems, you, you really did have two buckets, right? I mean, it was stuff that you had access to and then things you had to authenticate to, and that was it. There was no other delineation. Um, so we, we have that still today. Where we tend to get tripped up is when these systems start merging together, either because of acquisition uh, or um, things that come into play, new technology, right? So you, you end up having things like file shares that start popping up. And I think we'll probably be dancing around each other talking about, I'll use the words structured and unstructured data <laughs> in, a, in a little bit. I um, wanted to get that one out there first. Um, but it, it becomes much more complex once you start rolling into the picture of all of these other things. You know, it's not, it's no longer just Skippy or Sally logging in from their, uh, their 3270 uh, terminal to the mainframe. It is, you know, they're on a PC, they're hitting a web app, which has client server components as well. And all this other stuff tied into it. So I'm, I'm off on a tangent, obviously here. No, but, no, that's okay. Although I was going to yeah. say, you're going to date yourself by talking to a thir- by talking about a 3270. Although the sad thing is, I know what a 3270 is, and I, <laughs> I'm not, I refuse to date myself the way you've dated yourself. But um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, let me let me qualify that. I never used a 3270 terminal that had twin acts. All right, so I, I never I never did that. So that I'm not that old. And so. no, no, we're not going to we're not going to explain to anybody what twin acts is. Um, <laughs> If you'd like, we can talk about Token Ring. Um, Please no. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do go off on tangents. But, you know, one of the things that I th- you know, the other piece of this is government regulation. You know, you work in um, insurance. Yep. I work in a pharmaceutical company. Uh, we have regulated data. We have compliance data. We have all these other pieces. How do those parts start adding in? I knew you were going to ask that. The components of data that are regulated, that fortunately for us, there aren't that many. I mean, it, it's, it's the same for most everybody. It's social number. It's uh, a driver's license number. Um, it's bank account information. Um, the, you know, the, the other big gorilla in the room are, are credit cards. Right, and and those things have driven us bonkers over the years. Well, and don't forget, you're an insurance company, and like me, I'm going to guess that you deal with some healthcare data. So let's not leave out HIPAA. Yeah, interesting story there, right? And um, I, I probably should have given you the, this disclaimer at the beginning. You know, my my comments, uh, things I say, are are my opinions and my statements only, and don't necessarily reflect those of the company for which I work. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, let's be clear here, although. <laughs> We should probably say it more often. Um, yeah, we all speak for ourselves on the mobile cast. Yep. So nothing that either I say, Bill says, or any of our other guests say represent um, what our company's thoughts are. Yep. And being that you work for an insurance company, it makes at least you're not a lawyer, um, or else we would have had this much earlier. Or, nor do I play one, uh, although I, although I talk to them quite frequently. Um, the, um, the how you handle this information is. It really is contingent upon what the regulation says, right? In, in the case of, of HIPAA, um, HIPAA is fairly long in the tooth, as we all know. And then, you know, high tech came along. And then most recently we had the, uh, what was that? The title, the actual title of the document. It's like a 500-page uh, clarification, which is hilarious if you think about it, um, that talks about uh, increasing the scope of uh, covered entities in particular, um, so, so yeah, we have to treat that data with with kid gloves, and and like any other insurance company, most you get most of that through your claims processing. So let me, so but let me ask a question. You, we talk about kid kid gloves and everything else. When we look at it that way, you know, without going into the regulations, what it pretty much says is you have to protect your data, you have to encrypt it, you have to do your best to make sure nobody who's not authorized to look at it can look at it. Right, and, and that's 
really grossly oversimplifying. Well, it, it, is, it is, but n- not really, right? So <laughs> it, it does get back to the two-bucket model. A lot of these systems, again, I'll, I'll, I'll keep saying it, have grown up over time from these fairly monolithic, fairly static application structures. And in a lot of ways, the only way that you can adequately pr- protect that those structures is to say you can access it or you can't and not get very granular uh, once you're inside. Wait, wait, I, th- I think you're there because, you know, because quite honestly, my next question is, would the two-bucket piece work? And I, I quite honestly, I think it does. Um, but that's one of the reasons I wanted a security person on here to tell me whether I had my head up my ass. Yeah. Uh, and yes, we can use words like that on the podcast. Okay. Um, but, you know, I look at, okay, so if we go with two buckets, it's either stuff we own or we don't. If we own it, we encrypt it, which means no matter where it is, it's still encrypted. Yeah. You know, and th- you know, that was the statement I made in my caper. We encrypt it all in the beginning. And if it, you know, if we're putting an encryption system in now, we encrypt all the data we have. But the other piece of it is we still have the um, identity and access management. And that piece is separate from the encryption. So whether the data is encrypted or not, it should still be whether or not you have rights to see it. Very, you know, very right. simple. You, you don't – we've been doing access management on data since the beginning of time. You know – I'm not, I'm not going to date myself, but, you know, for me, <laughs> I'm going to start with the beginning of Windows, although I come in before the beginning of Windows. But, you know, with Unix and everything else, we always put access on it. You know, we always had access rights, how you were doing things. So that hasn't changed other than the fact that you may have to be more careful how you apply them. Is that right? It, it is. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it's always – becomes hysterical whenever I try to draw for one of the, the new folks in our team because people come and go. The, the, the Bell Lapidula model or, or the BIPA models on, the, on a whiteboard because you have to do, use different colors and, and draw you know three-dimensional cubes and, and things like that, and, and they look at you like you're crazy. But you, you tell them, well, this is how stuff works under the covers or how it's supposed to work. And trying to apply that to these other systems that never were designed to take this stuff into account. Um, I, I don't know. I just it, uh, it makes it complex. I mean, I I, yeah. I, th- I think that's where you're going. And, you know, I've actually sat through this. So, you know, I've worked at a financial company. I've worked at a pharmaceutical company. I've worked at, um, you, you know, I said financial. I've also worked at a bank, you know, for a while there. I was a contractor, you know, and, a uh, IT contractor. So I, I've been in a bunch of different places. And, you know, part of this really gets defined by the vendor itself because the vendor comes in and tries to tell you that they can do do all this. And they spin you a story of how complex it is to actually do it and why their software and or hardware makes it easy, um, which, by the way, is never the case. I think we'll both agree to that one. <laughs> um, it- Go ahead. No, as I say, it's, it's, it's a common theme, right? It's everybody has a solution to your problem, except that people really don't know what their problem is. I, I think that that's a great way to put it. Right. You know, they define your problem for you as opposed to you saying, here's my problem. How does your tool help me get around it and solve yep. it? Yep. And so where we end up in a lot, a lot of places in a lot of ways is – you know, it becomes so mind bending to try to tweeze apart pieces of data from the information to say, well, we need to do this for social numbers. We need to do that for driver's license. We need to do these things for uh, PHI, you know, the personal health information. Um, but all in the context of one application structure. And people's eyes just glaze up and turn up in their heads. It's called the glaze factor. And, and you then fall back to, well, what can we do? Well, you, you say, well, we can authenticate to the application, or you don't. So you end up putting this perimeter around all the stuff that the application handles. And, and you say, well, there's our two buckets, stuff that's outside and stuff that's inside. And, and you know, that's re- for me, it's keep it simple. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And 
I look at it and say, okay, we can make this much more difficult, but if you don't start somewhere, it doesn't mean that your system can't grow more complex and can't become more nuanced as you move forward. But if you start out simple and say, look, I'm going to encrypt everything I have. And if it doesn't come from me, I don't care because yep. it's public data at that point. Now, I've had a couple of people say, well, you know, what tools do you use, everything else? I'm honestly going to stay out of the tool piece. And um, some people may not be happy with me for that. But there are tools out there that allow you to do the encryption. You know, the biggest fight in the past was we don't have enough cycles for it. And today, anybody can throw up a VM and start processing anything. So I don't think that's an argument that truly holds water. But, you know, one of the things is you encrypt all the data. And if somebody decides to put it in Dropbox or move it around or anywhere else, it doesn't matter because even if somebody gets in there, it's encrypted and they can't get in without the keys. Now, that doesn't mean that it's easy. It means now you have to come up with a way to give, sit, give each person their own key, which unlocks the data. But if you have a way to do that and you can give it out to their devices, so whether or not they have a phone, a tablet, or a PC – they can open the data as long as the app can use the key and you can authenticate yourself and you have rights to it. Right. So I, you know, and this is where we start getting to mobile. You know, the, the biggest question we have is how do we keep, you know, our data safe? Because, you know, it's much easier to lose a phone than it is to lose a laptop. And by the way, people, people lost laptops for a long time. Before smartphones came out, laptops were the, you know, I, if I remember the number, there was something like 100,000 laptops left at, um, left at uh, airport security over three years or something like that. And oh, it was some it, outrageous number. It's obscene. It's absolutely obscene. And, and even in our case, you know, we're, we're a big company and um, it's not, we're not a public company, which is another interesting discussion for a different day. But we have many tens of thousands of devices, and and yes, there's a there's a percentage that you expect to go missing on a on a frequent and regular basis, either through uh, accidental loss or or theft, and um, you have to take that stuff into account. Now, I, ironically, uh, the, the 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 more data that these devices can hold, the, the faster we are in in actually running away from having data be local on the devices, um, which is kind of weird. It, it's, it's weird, but what makes it interesting is a lot of people look at it and say, well, I'll never put data on the device, and we try and explain to them the network isn't ubiquitous. As much right. as we'd like to think the network's ubiquitous, if you've ever tried to make a phone call in New York City, you've ever tried to use any device in San Francisco, which is the same as New York City, um, there's no bandwidth. You may have four bars and you still can't make a phone call. You still can't pull up a web page. And yet we expect our apps to be able to get into the cloud and whether it's a private cloud, public cloud, on-premise data, it doesn't matter. And we expect it to be able to use that data for people to get their jobs done. And it doesn't work that way. Um, yep. You can't guarantee it. So as much as we'd like to say data shouldn't be on a device, and to be fair, people are going to move it around themselves. You know, there are flash drives. One of the reasons Dropbox and Box and SugarSync and all that are so popular is people want to be able to do their work when they have time to do it and where it's convenient. So whether that's home, laptop, whatever device it is. Like, and, and those services are are absolutely exploding. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I get a link from somebody or a request or somebody that says, hey, you know, retweet, retweet my request for this service and – you know, get four more to do it for you, and you get you get one for yourself, and I get five gig, and you get five gig, and you know, I, I probably got at my disposal today thirty or forty gig of basically free storage out in the cloud somewhere that is just begging to be used for something cr uh, creative. Um, and you know, if if we're thinking and talking about those kinds of things, you know, the folks that we that we call users, and we need to be very careful about that term, are absolutely thinking about it as well, regardless of what most in IT might think. Right? And that kind of swings us back again to this, this uh, you know, two-bucket, three-bucket, four-bucket conversation, is how do we enable folks to do what they really want to do and need to do in a way which doesn't put 
the stuff they're working with at an increased level of risk. Uh, and, and it's it's absolutely a risk conversation. Yes. Um, you know, can't, can't agree with you more on that one. And, you know, it's what makes it so interesting when you watch companies, st- you know, nobody decides to start simple. It's always, let's come up with our 30 buckets. And I kind of look at, you know, let's look at, you know, take my situation, you know, my example and convert it to yours. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about is I think sometime in the next two years we're going to start seeing what um, the MIM model, which is mobile information management yep. um, on mobile devices. And um, as we start to see that happen, what that means is that the security and the policy follows the data. So we're talking about security from the perspective of I said let's encrypt all the data, which means in rest and transit, it's always encrypted. And – then we give out keys and we use identity and access management. But there's another piece of policy there, which is I think where these other buckets should really come in. And so, for example, if we're looking at – there may be data that, is, that should never leave a campus. You can only look at it when you're on campus. doesn't mean it can't be on your device, but you should only be able to actually open that data while you're on campus. So you're looking at geolocation. You know, you know where you are. You can actually – Maybe it's VDI. Maybe it's an app that can actually access this information while you're in your campus's buildings. When you walk off of that campus, you can no longer access it because the policy says, no, you're not allowed to do it. And that and that's where I see those other buckets becoming very useful. Yep. I, 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 would, I would agree. And, uh, I mean, and to kind of to swing back a, a little bit to one of your comments when you started just in this, this latest thread here, um, you know, why why do organizations go for the 30 bucket model and the answer is probably overly simplistic to say it this way but the typical enterprise level budget processes abhor simplicity right because what that what happens is is if you're not able to tell somebody in very explicit detail how much this thing is going to cost over this period of time for this many people and what the result is going to be, you're not going to get budget for it, right? So if you just say to somebody, well, all we need is two buckets and it's going to cost this much, they'll say, well, what about the situation where you've got this regulation that says you have to do this with that or, um, you know, you've got 201 CMR 17 that says you can't have driver's licenses hanging out in the breeze, but yet if they're co-located with this other piece of data, it then becomes different. So that's where the 30 buckets come from. But to, to your point, that becomes something which can't be implemented because it takes too long to figure out how to do it. So, so let's take that and, you know, you had an argument to make on structured and unstructured data. <laughs> and, um, Oh, you know, boy. I, I'm going to just throw I'm going to throw a little thing in here because I'm I think Dave McCrory may listen to this and I mentioned this to him today. Um, Dave McCrory's um, has this great theory of data gravity, which is actually pretty awesome, and relates um, data to physics and how it acts. And one of the things we were talking about actually yesterday, we were talking about structured and structured and unstructured data. I'm getting tongue tied as well. Is this theory of dark data? sort of like dark matter. And, you know, I'm, I want to let you run with that for a minute. Yeah, so it, it was kind of one of those things that kind of popped into my head, I think, uh, because of the peach moonshine. I was consuming that evening, but uh, which is very good, by the way, uh, from a company called Old Smoky. N- not an endorsement, just uh, happened to be the ones that are stocked up here. Uh, we love to talk about, we being IT, you know, the, the industry, we love to talk about how we're going to protect data and applications and how we can classify things and put um, and categorize stuff. And that all works great from a programmatic access perspective, right? So if you've got a database doing your access, you've got application logic that's going to retrieve things for you based upon who you are and what groups you belong to, that works great. That amount of information is generally very quantifiable because we people have to know how much they have because they have to be able to have systems that can manage it and maintain it. Um, the, the other side of that is the 
unstructured side. And unstructured is a very bad term for this because it's. I could make a very good argument to say that spreadsheets and file folders are structured data when, in fact, they are unstructured. But we end up with this massive collection of co-located information and data in documents, in files, in folders, in file systems that does not lend itself to any level of effective programmatic access. And if you can't use some method of programmatic access, all of your identity and access management tools kind of become moot, right? You, you have to fall back to this two-bucket model. In well, other I, words, right? I, well, I would certainly agree with you there. If you're with the two-bucket model, it doesn't matter what kind of data it is. Exactly. If it's in your perimeter, you protect it. Yep. You encrypt it. Um, I'm not sure I fully agree with your unstructured model of, well, you may have data in your Excel spreadsheet, so you have to classify it, but I also look at it's an Excel spreadsheet. You put permissions on it. Now, I may be really too simplistic here, uh, but, you know, some, sometimes I think we like to, you know, we can't see the forest for the trees. And, you know, it's a matter of it's an Excel spreadsheet. You put read access on it. You put write access on it. And if you created it in a way that you have data that can't mix, that's the problem of the creator slash, you know, the administrator who owns that document, not necessarily making it structured or unstructured, but yeah, what do yeah. I know? Yeah, boy, this is – we could do several more sessions on that topic alone, I think. Um, the, the, the challenge is that this is stuff that people use to run – Departments. They, it's used to run call centers. It's used to run their day-to-day -day operations. And notice I didn't talk about line of business applications because those are the things that typically are used to, like, like in our case, you know, um, sell and, and uh, insurance, maintain policies, you know, policy administration systems. But a lot of the other stuff that is not part of those application suites is every, everything else. Um, I would argue that it's just as important as the the multi terabyte databases that are used for uh, holding policyholder data. Right, all this other stuff is equally as important, but we typically don't have the ability to. I, I won't say protect it because we absolutely can protect it, but we can't protect it. We can't. I'm getting to talk myself in circles. We, we, well, we, have a, but, we, have a, we have a hard time provisioning it in a way which enables access to those who need to see it and, and deny access to those who don't have a reason to see it. See, what I find interesting is, you know, when you say talk yourself into circles, that, you know, it's very easy to get into the weeds when we look at this. Yes. You know, neither of us would disagree with that, you know. We're still looking at this very simplistically, and I'm doing that purposely because I think that if you get into the weeds, it becomes much harder, and yet everybody insists on getting into the weeds. And I, and I kind of look at it and say, wait a second. If we didn't encrypt anything, for, forget security on the data itself from an encryption perspective. Don't you have access management on the data? You know, forget that there are, you know, forget that I have an iPhone or an iPad or a Samsung Galaxy Tab or a Nexus 7. Don't you have permissions on the data? Well, yeah, we do. Okay. So what we're talking about is we don't want to get rid of that piece. You've already been doing that forever. All we're saying is let's add some security to that from an encryption perspective. And let's add an identity management system that allows us to do this from a device that isn't necessarily on campus anymore. And we can maybe do single sign-on or some other pieces. You know, in reality, I'm trying to connect you, your podcast, your mobile cast here with the one that we did last week with um, Paul Madsen, where mm -hmm. we talked about single sign-on and native apps and uh, web apps and all that. But I, I just every time I look at this, I just see people going so far into the weeds that they never get started. The, the tendency is to look for the fringe cases because those are the ones, honestly, that, that create the most amount of churn in any uh, engineering or, or implementation effort. Right, so it's it's very easy to define and plan for the 
we'll say the 95 or the 99 percent. I probably shouldn't use that term, but you know, the one percent or the or the one tenth of one percent of the use cases are the ones that people get wrapped around the axle for. And you know, it comes back to your point about you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but people will strive for perfect because that allows them to say that they've got closure on things from a from a design perspective, which means they can say that and get budget for it. Yeah, and, and you know, we're talking about we're talking about data, we're talking about categorization, talking about security, but it happens in everything. It's that strive for perfection and covering every case that keeps so many people and so many organizations from starting stuff. You know, well, if I can't cover everything, I can't do it right. Why start at all? And you know, the companies that are saying, you know what, I'm just going to dig in. I'm just going to figure out how to do it, and I'm, you know, and here's where I'm going to bring this all back to mobile. There are, you know, there there are companies. No, it, it works. <laughs> you know, there are companies that a couple of years ago said, "Look, we have these, we have these smartphones, we have these iPhones. Let's just embrace them and let's throw everything behind them and figure out how to work with them." And those are the companies that are ahead right now. It doesn't mean that people can't catch up, but there's still other companies that are looking at going. Um, I'm still not sure. You see the same thing with cloud. You see the same thing with data security. Um, you see the same thing in InfoSec. I mean, it, it can't be easy. Yeah. If, if things were easy, we well, I probably wouldn't have a job if things were easy, right? I mean, that, that's that's the that's that's another story there. I, I guess if I had to look at it a different way, uh, mobile is driving a lot and, and mobile is is not just phones it's not just iPhones it's not just blackberries or or Android devices um, I think we kind of danced around this a few times on on the uh, mobile biz and mobile sec biz chats over over time um, mobile could be byod right or it is byod it is mobile is using a different device to get access to the same applications, right? And it may not be a corporate device. Oh, it may, not be, it may not be a corporate managed device. And it can also oh. be a laptop. You know, I don't tend to work in the laptop arena, but it can also be a laptop. You know, I have, yep. I use a MacBook. And if you'd said five years ago, Brian, you'll be using a MacBook at your company, I would have laughed at you because there was no way they were going to let them in. Today, I have a MacBook because it's just, it's easier for me to get my work done. I don't think about my computer anymore. I think about what I'm doing. Now, one thing I will say, and it is somewhat ironic, I think, in that the proliferation of that model is in some ways hindering progress in figuring out how to deal with data at a much lower level. For for example, we're, we're doing some internal things um, and I'm part of one, one of those things which have allowed me to not have to take um, my corporate device home for over a year and a half now and I'm able to work remotely uh, and very securely and actually I think again personal opinion um, well no, I think as securely put it that was put it that way a, as having a, a corporate mobile device but I don't have it anymore and the net effect of that is, any of the stuff I work with never leaves the confines except for screen bits of the data center. Um, that's about as big of a two-bucket system as you can get, right? I mean, it, it it no longer deals with, you know, the, the individual elements, but it does, um, it lets me do my job where and, I'm at. And, and you know what? You know, one of the reasons we talk about this is, you know, when we talk about mobile... And one of the reasons that, you know, I spent two blog posts on this this week is, you know, for twofold, really. I think everybody's partially responsible for security. It's not just people who are in InfoSec. I think it's from the people using the devices, the end users, up through um, the developers, up through IT, up through the business unit. You know, my livelihood depends on the fact that my company can do business. And, you know, if my company's not making money because... I'm insecure and I'm letting important data out. Um, that's a problem. But you know, the other piece of that is 
what mobile is really starting to bring about and the revolution that you're starting to see is mobile's talking about enabling the user. And when you enable the user to get their work done when and where they need to, and that doesn't necessarily have to be their desk anymore, um, they have a tendency, you know, we as users have a tendency to become more productive and efficient. And as we start doing that, the question becomes, well, how do we become that, you know, so flexible and agile to be able to work anywhere and still do it securely? And yes, there you can do it with no bits leaving the data center. Um, although I challenge you to say people can take screenshots. Um, you can do it with data on your device, but the question is, how do you do it securely, which is where these pieces fit together? Yep, yep, it, it, absolutely correct. And, uh, and and yes, people can absolutely take pictures over your shoulder. Um, you could have malware in your device taking screenshots every three seconds. No argument, but it comes down to a velocity factor in how much data you could lose over a period of time. Uh, if I've got no data on my machine in a structured format, the most somebody's going to be able to do is get screenshots. G- great. They, they get away with one f- complete record of something every four or five minutes versus walking off with a, a multiple gigabyte um, database that might ha- that would happen to be on my PC that had had everything in it, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's a velocity issue. Um, coming back to the mobile device thing, right? So we're in a... We're in a good place right now, I think, with mobile devices and data protection. Sounds kind of weird to say it that way for, for a couple of reasons. We, we, today, we don't yet have a lot of data on these devices. We, we, we really don't. Um, so the, the potential for loss is still there, but the, the amount of data you would potentially lose is still pretty small. That's going to change. Um, but I'm not sure when it's going to change. Two years, three years, um, I don't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, yeah, I, I think this is probably a good spot to end it on. Otherwise, we'll be talking for another <laughs> hour and a half. Yeah. Um, which isn't a bad thing, um, you know, because we'll have you back on again. And, you know, maybe we'll have Bob to join you next time. So, you know, this is a call out to Bob Rudiff, so you don't get to escape this either. Um, and Peach Moonshine or Bourbon will be accompanying the next one if we do it. We'll do it in person, maybe. Absolutely. And so uh, to make it a little bit more fun. But, you know, you know this has been a- absolutely been, been great. So, Bill, let's start with where can we follow you on Twitter? How about where can we can find you on the web? And where can we start, you know, you know, where to look for some of this stuff and, you know, start thinking about this stuff? Sure. So on Twitter, um, a, a really bad handle I chose, uh, gosh, five years ago at this point. It's A-W-P-I-I-I. It's three I's, not two. Um, it, it throws people for a loop, and uh, but but that's me. Uh, on the web, I have a uh, not quite dormant blog, but it, it, it'll get ramped back up. It's infosectoday.blogspot.com. And, uh, and, and we'll put both of those um, yep. links, both your uh, Twitter handle and your blog, um, in the show notes. Yep. And for anybody who might happen to also be on app.net, uh, same same handle, A-W-P-I-I-I. Um, interesting, interesting place out there as well. A- excellent. Um, thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate you spending the time tonight because we are doing this um, at 9 o'clock at night. And for everybody else out there, if you like the show, please tell a friend, leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at the Mobilecast or on the web at thecloudcast.net where you can find links to everything Cloudcast and Mobilecast. We're working on some great shows. This is actually the second show I recorded today. And if you have suggestions of stuff you'd like to see, please send them in. And until next time, thanks for listening. 